name is Tom Russell. I'm a learning specialist with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. We have Nadia and Nahi as well, a learning solutions officer also with the Academy. And just to talk about my experience, so coming to a proposal writing, I've worked in Haiti. Um, there was the earthquake in 2010 and the cholera outbreak the following year. So I started my humanitarian career supporting teams in Haiti responding to those double uh, crises. Uh, I was also in Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar was an area where off the Indian Ocean there are cyclones that repeatedly pass through the country and I was part of a team supporting the resilience of the population to uh, yeah to get through the period of cyclone and the effects that those give. Then I also worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and we were looking at the uh, Ebola response back in 2018 through to 2020. And more recently now with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, I've been supporting training and learning opportunities. Uh, this is a photo of a training we did in Poland in March of this year. So that sort of gives you a little bit of my background, and it's great to see people uh, joining and, and, and where you're from. So. Um, the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, we are set up to support people working in humanitarian response work or looking to learn more about humanitarian response work or make that transition from development work. So we provide everything from e-learning, in-person support, um, we have virtual reality and simulations as well. So this is a, a webinar that we're offering to explore effective proposal writing. Now, uh, Nadia, you have a poll that you're going to set up using Mentimeter, so I'm going to give you the control. You can share your screen, and just to get a sense of of, of where we are, uh, we're going to run a couple of polls using Mentimeter. So, Nadia, please do go ahead and share your screen. Do I need to give you control? No, that's okay. Um, let me just share it Thank now. Thank you very much. Well, great. Thanks for typing in the chat where you're from. I think we are now at, see how many people we have on the call. We've got 57 participants. Fantastic. I can see people from uh, in Ukraine. Uh, fantastic. Nigeria. Super. I can see people typing in the chat already. Thank you very much. We're asking who enjoyed exams at school. We do have a poll in Mentimeter, which we should be able to get up on the screen for you in a moment. Um, great, thank you, Nadia. So Mentimeter, here you go. So you should be able to see now uh, we have on Mentimeter the opportunity to log in. So yeah, Nadia, off, off, you, you go for it. Thank you. Yeah, so if you if you don't mind getting out your phones and going to menti.com and you use the code that's at the very top. Uh, so it's this, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse. But it's this, uh, this code over here, 89354637. And yeah, just give me your answer on here, if you don't mind. So you've got one person who gets anxious before doing exams. One person that loves exams. Wow, I commend you. I wish I loved doing exams. Great. So it looks like we've got most of us are falling in the, the column of we get a bit anxious before doing them. We don't mind them, but perhaps we prefer homework. So there's a few of us who, who really enjoy love exams, a few of us who really don't like them. And I can see other people also typing in the chat. That's great. Um, exams. So you might be wondering, what, why are we talking about exams? I thought we'd come here to learn about proposal writing. Well, often when we come to proposal writing, we, we can imagine it slightly like an exam. Perhaps we come to the proposal writing period or we're asked to get involved. And for some of us, we really don't like it. Um, 
we get maybe a bit anxious before doing it. And the idea of this session is to help us feel a bit more confident for when we get asked to get involved in preparing a proposal, to be more confident about well, what it is it what is it about? How can we prepare effective proposals that are going to help us communicate the needs that we're seeing to donors and create relationships to support those needs with the donors. So we have another quiz, another poll on the Mentimeter Nadia. Next one, thanks. So proposal writing, what experience do you have in proposal writing? So again, with the Mentimeter, the same link, you should see a new question pop up. Let's get an idea across the room. What experience do we have here? We're about um, maybe 60 people or so now on the on the call, 64 participants. What experience do we have in proposing, in preparing proposals? Great, Nan, please, if you're just joining the call, please do uh, introduce yourself in the chat, in the Zoom chat with your name, uh, your role, the organization you work for and where you're calling from, where you're based, where you're working. Great, so it looks like a real mixture of experience. So we have some people leading proposal writing in their team. Some people always involved, a real, a real rich, diverse group, which is great. And some of us, for some of us, we're perhaps seldom involved, but we, we want to be involved more. We'd like to learn more about the proposal writing process, what's involved, and how we can get involved, how we can contribute and support that process. Great. Super. Okay, well, Nadia, if you want to keep that open um, on that question, we can come back to that. And then I'll come back to Thank you. So I should be sharing my screen. If not, I will go back to sharing my screen. Super. Um, great. So proposal writing, what are we talking about? What is a proposal? If you can type your answer in the chat, what do we mean by proposal? What does a proposal mean to you? So you should be able to see my screen. And the question is, what is a proposal? So today we're talking about effective proposal writing. If you can type your answers in the chat, what is a proposal? What does a proposal mean for you and your team and the work that you do? What is a proposal? Great. Yeah, it's a document that we prepare to solicit funding. Exactly. So it's a, a document that we put forward. It's an opportunity. That's right. An opportunity for us to to create a project to sort of respond respond but what are we responding to yes a detailed project outline thank you uh, louise it's a way for us to describe and present what the project is about and how we're going to do it exactly so it's a project where we're effectively we're looking for funding it's a project where we we want to persuade those who have funds to support our work, to support us, to convince donors perhaps to continue supporting us. Exactly, taking an idea and making it into an action. And often a proposal becomes a contractual reference. This means that whatever we put in that proposal, we need to be confident we can do it. We need to be able to deliver our promises because this becomes a contract with the funding organization. Great to see your responses coming through. We talk about who we're going to support, the types of activities based on the need exactly. So it's a response of the need that we see. We're asking for funding to support a response. And as someone also already mentioned, it's a blueprint for the project, an outline of what we're going to do. So like we're building a, a construction building and the blueprints are found within the proposal. Brilliant. Exactly. And it's a communication. We're looking for funding to meet a human need that we are aware of. Um, what are the main donors that you work with in your uh, countries and your projects? Again, type your answers in the chat. Who are the major donors that you work with? Who are the major donors that you work with? UNICEF, BHA, ECHO, super. Does everyone know what BHA and ECHO are? 
can see Echo FCDO. Great, thank you. Enable QFFT. I'm not familiar with. Fantastic. So we can see we're noticing there's some acronyms. Perhaps there's some acronyms that you're you're not familiar with. BHA, the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Echo from the European Union. UNICEF. WHO, GIZ, EU. Fantastic. So these are largely institutional donors. Does anybody work with private donors, foundations? I can see family foundations, corporates, fantastic. So in this call, what we're gonna be talking about is largely based on my experience working with institutional donors. So as we look at this, I'm gonna put another question on the screen. As we look at this, we're gonna be looking at it from perspective of institutional donors. Um, so here are the institutional donors that I'm familiar uh, working with, uh, UNICEF. USID is now BHA. Uh, a lot of people noted that in the chat. Um, and there we have ECHO. And UK Aid is also known as FCDO. So today's session is primarily through the lens of how we write proposals to our institutional donors. And I'll be looking through the lens of the format with ECHO. So I did just ask on the screen, thank you for those responding. What do you want to learn during this webinar? We have, we're 15 minutes into the 90 minutes. What do you want to learn? We're gonna have some time together as a big group and then some time uh, reflecting individually using a, uh, a board that we can write on together. What makes a winning proposal? Top tips, creating logical frameworks, great. What else do you want to learn? Type in the chat. What else do you want to learn from this session? What are the key qualities of a winning proposal? Super. Nadia, if you could make a note of these as they come through at some point, and then after the break, or during the breaks, share them with me so we can make sure we go through them. How to win grants, what not to write in a proposal. Exactly. Sometimes it can be helpful to learn uh, what to avoid. Concept notes. Um, concept notes those uh, not familiar with is is sometimes the start of the conversation with the donor so concept note is often a very short form of a proposal document that might be just a few pages long that outlines what we want to be able to do but without having to go into the time and effort preparing a full proposal it it's a way to gauge with the donor do we want to uh, respond do we want to support you and it can save time later on um so what criteria are used thank you very good Mohammed. what are the criteria that are used to assess a proposal. So the donor, we're looking at these institutional donors today, the donors all have their own guidelines, their own criteria that they use to evaluate who they want to work with. Um, before we go and look at how we can uh, work with donors, again in the chat, what challenges and frustrations have you experienced when preparing and submitting a proposal? So think back if you've already been involved in, say, leading a proposal or involved, what are the challenges and frustrations you've experienced when preparing and submitting a donor? Yes, um, Jad, good. How can I reach out to a donor? That's right. So we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, time, time, time. Yes, that's right. Time is of the essence. We can obviously have deadlines which are too short, a tight deadline. Um, Yes, why is it BHA? I thought BHA was just part of USID. Good question. So BHA had a rebranding re uh, a few years ago. Um, I think there was a, a merger between Food for Peace and USID. I could be wrong, but I might, I'll, I'll check in the break. <laughs> but I think there was a merging of the two, which was why it's now BHA. The format, the criteria can be a challenge, frustrating. Perhaps you've been using online forms where you have to use a certain number of characters and get your argument across and that can be a real challenge. Um, budgeting, yes. Um, budgeting, perhaps you can say a bit more what you mean about budgeting and what issues and challenges you've had. So majority of donors coming from relationship and advocacy. Um, okay, least number of donations we received are from call proposals. A good point. So there's the importance of working with donors is a, it's a relationship it's not just submitting a proposal that's the formal side that we see at the end involving partners at the last minute due to time constraints that's right not having enough data um short time can we do a proper assessment really good comments really important so somebody who already asked the question well how do we engage with donors so what is the process for approaching a donor um 
to seeing your comments now also in the chat thank you sometimes the calls too narrow criteria um, and we can't meet doesn't really match the reality so think about that about as we prepare a proposal to how can we overcome these challenges so hopefully by the end of this session you might have some ideas of how to overcome these challenges or feel a bit more confident about addressing them next question you can see on the screen is what is the process or procedure for approaching a donor to request for funding what is the process you can again use the chat type your answers in the chat that'd be great good point there from Anastasia about making sure the budget is correct at the start and we don't make too many changes to it during the implementation yes how do we how do we attract donors so how do we create that conversation with them what's the process what would you describe the process to be is it like we see in this picture is it a question of seeing where they are giving them a ring uh, passing from one donor to the next to see who's available, who's who's willing to to work with us. Concept note: look for call cool proposals exactly. So, the concept note, as we said before, is often the the start of the process. Sometimes donors will ask for a concept note to be prepared before moving into a full proposal. Call cool, full cool proposals exactly. So, some donors will advertise. This is from the UK government. Um, advertising call for proposals online in formal uh, settings, um, engaging with the donor in the in the locations where you work and where the donor is operating exactly. So when I was working in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we would often meet with Echo, meet with the donors in person, and that would be the start of a conversation that would happen even before there is a formal publications. And there are annual calls. Yes, that's correct, Christina. So annual calls like. Echoes HIP, um, HIP, if anyone familiar with, um, I've forgotten, there we go, humanitarian implementation plans, humanitarian implementation plans. So under ECHO, which is funding from the European Union, they, every year, they have a call, which they call an appel, um, a call, an annual call. So there'll be some times of the year when you can expect there to be calls for proposals with ECHO. Has anyone here made a submission to ECHO? Or is anyone planning to when the next HIP HIP is published? For this, if you can just raise your hand using the function in Teams, sorry, not Teams, we're on Zoom. Uh, you should be able to raise your hand on Zoom. So raise your hand if you're already working with ECHO or you're planning to in the next HIP, Nick, HIP, please, please raise your hand. So during this session, we will be looking at examples from ECHO. Um, based on my experiences, we'll be using the ECHO framework. That's an example. I know there'll be differences between different organizations, different donors, but to guide us through our session, we'll be looking at the forms and the framework that ECHO use. Um, great. So we know. Yes, yeah, so important we need to be able to build our case, present old projects to potential donors. Also at the headquarters level, so perhaps you have colleagues somewhere else in the world who can speak to donors on your behalf and they might then come to you and ask information. So sometimes I know in the Congo when I was working there, sometimes it was the team in Switzerland who would speak to donors in Switzerland and they would come to us to ask for information, but they would take a lead on preparing the proposal. Um, and sometimes it can be the country team exact themselves leading forward the proposal writing process. Um, one aspect that you will need to think about before approaching the donor is a go, no go meeting, a go, no go meeting. If you've raised your hands for the last point, you can now lower your hands. Thank you very much. Um, that's just to get an idea of how many people had experience with ECHO. Type in, oh, now I'm asking you to raise your hand again for a different question. So raise your hand again if you can tell me what a go, no go meeting is. What is a go, no go meeting? Can you raise your hand if you, if you, if you think you know the answer? Great, I can see hands coming up. So it sounds like you're familiar. If you've raised your hand, type in the chat. What do we mean by a go, no go decision? And what factors will influence your no go go decision? So a go no go meeting is is that's right. Someone said it there. Decision made often by the SMT. What do we mean by SMT? 
senior management team. So a go, no go meeting is often what happens within the team that you're working with, the organization to decide, do we go for this opportunity? That's right, assessing the opportunity and whether we will respond to it or not. So this is a key step for us to go through. What factors will influence your decision? So perhaps you found out, you've learned that, okay, great, there's a, an, a, a appell from Echo. It's in January 1st. Um, so what are the factors that will influence? So you're discussing with your team. Yes, does it match your organization project and strategy? Very good, Louise. Is what the donor is positioning themselves for, does it match with what your about as organization your strategy the budget and and what about the budget what what about the budget will influence your decision requirements perhaps to show you're referring to the donor requirements if you've raised your hand you can lower them again now and type in the chat what factors will influence your go no go decision super selling time that's allowed for the project, the conditions that the, the donor has, what sectors of intervention that you might be looking to get involved in, the amount of the envelope. Thank you, Tishagir. So how much money is available? Is this something that would uh, be a, a sum that fits in with the sort of projects that we work with? Jurisdiction. Yep. Yeah. Is it within our area where we operate? Is it within our mandate? Exactly. So this is something that we need to think about first as a team. So the first thing we should be doing is if we see a cool proposal, we can have a meeting. Uh, it can be very quick, could be on, on Zoom or on Teams to call in and say, right, before we get into preparing the proposal, are we all on the same page? Is it something that matches our mandate? Um, are there any security concerns that we need to be aware, aware of? But then once we do agree as a team, yes, we're gonna go for this proposal. What are the key steps in the process? What next? What are the next steps you're going to do to prepare for this proposal? Imagine, say, that you've decided, yes, we're going to go for this funding opportunity with ECHO or BHA. Proposal development plan. That's right. So what is your proposal development plan? What are the steps that you would work through? Uh, we thought of uh, about five steps. What steps are the key steps in the proposal writing process for you and your team. So you've agreed, you've decided to, to go for a proposal. What are the key steps that you want to work through? Conceptual framework creation. Great. Design workshop. Great. So you may decide, right, we need to come together as a team. What are you basing your design on? What's your creation of your framework based on? What's the, What might be something that precedes the design aspect, or always the first part of your design workshop. Yep, you need to prepare an implementation plan that describes what you're going to do in the project, but what might be the first, first step as you work out what to do? Thank you, Kiri. Make an assessment. That's what we were, were thinking of. So normally gathering information, an assessment, and there might be uh, information that's already available to you, um, or you might need to do your own assessment. Yeah, make sure you have a clear topic, a scope. So your needs assessment should help you identify what the gaps are and the needs that your project will address. So this is, I think, part of what people are already saying in the chat about knowing what our uh, jurisdiction is, um, knowing uh, whether what the call, how it responds to what we're able to do and what we're set up to do. And then people have already started talking about in the chat, creating the logic of our intervention. So this is where someone at the start wanted to learn about logical frameworks. Well, the logical framework is effectively, it's a table that summarizes on one page, the logic of our intervention, what your project is going to do, the change, thank you very much, the theory of change and the objective pre-analysis, thank you, uh, Abdurrahman. So you've developed your logic of ventures. So all this first step, this might be what you do in your design workshop. So again, working together with your team. And this is before perhaps uh, preparing the document itself, doing, doing the research. And then after that, we can then bring in the stages of our preparing our implementation plan, our budgets, and then address any cross-cutting issues or program quality issues. So this is where we can now start thinking about, well, what makes a winning proposal? What are the issues that the donors are particularly keen on and keen to, to learn more about? But before we do that, 
just to check in what what are the key documents that you might need for each of these steps so perhaps these are all very familiar to you already but at the step one doing the needs assessment and you're gathering information what are the key documents that you might want to submit into the proposal again type your answers into the chat what are the key documents that you'd be looking to submit market assessment study reports yep so if you're working say with the cash modality you want to understand well is cash appropriate in this uh, context yes concept note so if you have worked on a concept note you've probably talked about the needs already so make sure you go back to that exactly risk assessment um what do you mean by risk assessment context analysis cna report can you tell me what you mean by cna talking about your organization your background that's great so this first part when we talk about risk analysis echo will refer to risk analysis in two ways one way is what are the risks that the affected population are experiencing so how might their situation change over time what risks are they facing and then further down the line what risks might you have in delivering your project, delivering your response? So just be aware there's a nuance of, of risk. As we look at needs assessment, we're referring to the risk of the population that's been affected. In this point, we're here, we're looking at needs assessments. We've got a report, we've done some analysis, we've looked at secondary data, we've looked at other assessments that have been done by other organizations in the sector. Then when we come to identify gaps and needs, what are the key documents that we'll be looking at here? I think someone's already mentioned these. This is part of our working out what the problems are and how we can solve those issues. What other documents might you be using, submitting, preparing at step two to identify gaps and needs that your project will address? Yep, the data. So data coming from our needs assessment, locations, what difference, that will make and in terms of documents how do we how do we articulate that baseline data and what documents might we prepare somebody mentioned one of them earlier somebody mentioned a solution tree analysis so solution tree analysis for those of you this might not be something that everybody uses sometimes you might just want to go and look at the baseline data the context situation and from your experience you'll go straight into preparing a log frame but a step that I often recommend to teams is take the time to analyze the problem. Uh, what are the underlying problems that the people you're looking to support? It's like a theory of change. Thank you, Ismail. Yeah. So when we do a needs assessment, we're understanding the situation and what the problems are. And then a problem tree analysis, we want to say, well, what are the causes of those problems? So as we go deeper down the roots of a tree and try and work out well, what are the problems underneath that we don't see perhaps straight away that requires a bit of digging we need to learn a bit more about what's happening and then a solution tree somebody already mentioned it is is the inverse so if we see these problems and the solution should be what situation do we want to get to what's required um so if for example uh people don't have access to their crops because um of, of say um, road conditions and then if we know well if we can improve the road conditions and make access easier then people can get access to their crops and, and that's the fundamental problem is the access issue proposal narrative justification is the first time i've used the word narrative that's the i'm sure you're already aware the proposal narrative is the text part of the document yes and somebody's mentioned the hnohnp does anybody know what the hnohnp are um some are saying, can these be summarized in the HNO and HNP? So when we come to look at the needs assessments and analysis, often the in the humanitarian sector for each crisis, there is an HNO, thank you, a needs overview, um, part of the humanitarian response plan. And that will often include information about risk analysis. That's a really helpful resource to go to and also help us build a better understanding of the problem tree and solution tree. Um, so what I'd like us to do now, um, Nadia, we're going to move on to the murals now. Um, I asked you 
first of all, to think about what it's like uh, doing an exam. <laughs> um, how do we prepare for an exam? This is a question I haven't got on the screen. Um, how do we prepare for an exam? So if we imagine preparing a proposal is a bit like getting ready for an exam, we've got to get all our documents ready. What can help us be, be ready uh, to, to do an exam? Yes, read and understand as much as you can. Uh, understand that you're referring, Khalid, perhaps you're referring to the, the paper, the, the examination in front of you. Make sure you've understood the questions or are you referring perhaps to the content? Yep, the content of the exam. So perhaps doing your, your revision, your preparation. So we're going to move now to an exercise which should help us prepare, should help us prepare. So um, procedures and deadlines. Yep. So knowing knowing the subject matter, knowing the examiner. Thank you very much. So knowing what the examiner is looking for exactly. Come with your student card. That's right. You've got to be able to present who you are, present you the portfolio of your organization. Exactly. Know what sectoral standards are available, understand the procedures, the deadlines. You know, if you turn up to the exam hall and it's empty like this, you think, uh oh, am I too early or am I too late? Um, if there are lots of other people working away, you know you're in the right place. Um, we're going to go to another Mentimeter poll. Um, so, Nadia, it's the one where we've got the third uh, question in the poll. So, uh, Nadia, if you're happy to take control of the screen again, and we're going to ask you to decide what is the part of proposal writing that you're most uh, most interested in. And then you're going to have a bit more time to look at this individually, and you'll see the contributions of others at the same time. Thank you, Nadia. So we'd like to ask you, which sections would you like to learn more about? So we've been talking about a general approach to proposal writing, but within that, um, there are different sections different aspects and we'd like you to tell us what would you like to learn more about and there should be a, a question with a list that you can choose I think you can choose at least one perhaps you can choose a couple so choose the what you want to learn more about and you should see thank you Nadia Nadia sharing her screen you should see on there what is it that we're most interested in okay Oh, and just so you know, you can you can select two. Um, oh, so. fantastic. That's perfect. Great. So I'll ask you to select two. What are the two that you're most interested in? So this is, again, in Mentimeter. So if you're just joining us or you're, or you're catching up, you can go to menti.com and use the code, which is on the screen, 89354637. You can do that on your phone if you haven't got a chance to do it on your computer. Um, go to menti.com and I think uh, there's also in the chat you might be able to see uh, the link as well. Nadia, do you want to just post the link to the Mentimeter again in the chat as well for those who find that easier? Great, okay, so I can see that a lot of us want to know more about the logic of intervention. Some of us are citing the resilience marker, monitoring evaluation, Needs assessment, risk analysis. So just give you a couple more minutes to choose what is it that you're most interested in. And then after that, field coordination. Great. Good to see that that's gaining interest too. Logic and intervention is, seems to be the key one for us, the cornerstone that we're most interested in. implementation as well great okay just give you a, a couple more minutes to to respond um so what we're going to do now is we're going to we'll still all be on the same call but you'll have a chance to focus on one of these one or two of these areas and we're going to give you access to what's called a mural board a mural board it's like a a big white wall with the chance to put post and notes on it and we'll have a couple of questions for you but i'll give you a chance to go a dig a bit deeper in the time that we have so we're coming up to about the halfway mark so nearly the end of the first half of our session today fantastic can I, so can i stop sharing now so you can yes nadia thank you yes nadia can stop sharing 
So I will go back to sharing my screen. Um, let me just do that now. So I said at the start that we'll be looking at this through uh, the lens of ECHO and their frameworks, their forms. At the start, people are suggesting, oh, we need to use guidelines. What guidelines can we use? So the other thing we'd like you to do in preparation for the next piece is uh, to find the guide. Oh, actually, Nadia, could you put this in the chat, the link to this page and also the PDF to the e-single form into the chat, please? I think then people will be able to pick that out. Um, if you could do that, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, great. So for this, thank you very much. And Nadia has put a link in the chat. That's the link to the DG Echo Partners website, the DG Echo's Partners website, and you should see you should see something like this on the screen. Um, I'll also click on it myself, and if you scroll down, you should be able to find what's called. Um, let me just check. Here we go. The single form. The single form. The single form is Echo's proposal form. So we were talking about going into an exam room and making sure you know what, what the exam is going to look like and what the examiner is after. Well, this is how we can find out what ECHO interested in and the questions they're going to have for us. So we're going to explore this, these guidelines. So there's this document, single form guidelines. If you have the option to download it, please download it now onto your computer. Nadia, are you able to also put the file, the PDF file into the chat or do you want me to do that? Um, I'm trying to, but I'm not sure if I can attach a document. I'm just oh, okay. Over. If we can't attach a document, then uh, please do click uh, on the link, scroll down to where it says e single form, and then what you want to download is the single form guidelines, single form guidelines. So um, I'll leave that on my screen here on the right hand side of my screen. That's the document we'd like you to download, and it should look like this. So on the left-hand side, it might be a bit small on your screen. Um, this I can't is... see your screen right now. Oh, you can't see my screen? Oh, maybe I'm not sharing. How about now? Great. So I should be sharing my screen again? Yep. Great. So on the right-hand side is the web page. If you scroll down to the single form 2021, you should be able to download the single form guidelines. These are the guidelines from ECHO. Now each donor will have their own guidelines and they'll be different, but this is a really solid framework. So I always recommend ECHO, very thorough, comprehensive. On the left-hand side, you can see the table of contents for this document. And we're gonna ask you to have that open because we're then gonna give you an exercise to get to know these guidelines and start thinking about for your projects, to what extent are you meeting the guidelines already when you're preparing your proposals? So that's the question we're going to put to you for the for the second half of this session. Um, are there any questions about accessing those documents right now? First thing I'd like to ask, any questions about accessing those documents? If you're having any difficulty, let myself or Nadia know. Can you share the link again? Yeah, Nadia, I'll, I'll do that. So this is the link. Oh, hang on, uh, my copy and paste wasn't working there. So that's the link to the website. Scroll down to where it says the single form. And then you should be able to download by clicking on, there's just English on here, the single form guidelines. And the document that you should appear or should be able to download is this PDF document, which you can see on the left-hand side of my screen is a table of contents. This was updated in May of this year, so it's fairly current. And this is the template document, the guidance that you will see from ECHO. So I'll give you, give you an example. So if you wanted to look at the logic of intervention, lots of people did, it gives you guidance. So there's quite a bit of guidance here of expressing, well, what is it that the donor is after? What questions might they, they have for you? So in the time that we have, we're just going to each of us is going to choose um, 
individually one of these uh, one of these numbers. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. Um, yeah, great. So I've I've pulled out these numbers here, four through eleven. So that forms the core part of the proposal document when preparing a proposal to submit to ECHO. We've created four mural boards, which deals with each of these sections. So you've just, in the last exercise, you've decided which section you're most interested in. Now um, make a note of the mural board. And Nadia, if you can share the links to the mural boards in the chat, thank you very much, super. So you'll see now four links for boards, mural boards, mural boards A, B, C, and D. So if you're, if you said you were interested in needs assessments, that's number four, click on the mural board A. If you're interested in beneficiaries, that's still mural board A. If you're interested in gender and age marker or resilience markers, the markers, number six and eight, that's board B. And board C for section seven and nine, boards D for sections 10 and 11. So think back to the piece that you're most interested in, the number, and then go to the board that matches that. I'll show you now what the boards look like um, once I've got the right screen open. So this is a mural board. It's uh, Everyone should be able to get into it. And what you'll see is you'll see your section that you're most interested in. And there are two questions. So the first question is, how are you already meeting the donor requirements? How are you already meeting the donor requirements? And we'd like you to add your example. So here, uh, for example, for a needs assessment, I could say that I'm conducting uh, conducting a needs assessment is what I'm doing. And then I can just move that across to here. That's how I'm already meeting donor requirements. The second question, question two, what do you need to be doing? What do you need to do to be meeting the donor requirements? So perhaps there's something, if you go through now, if I was to go to needs assessments, this is what they're asking for. So for example, here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Problem needs and risk analysis. So here they're asking for a comprehensive risk analysis and a gender and age analysis. So I might say to myself, ah, oh, we're doing a comprehensive risk analysis, but we're not doing a gender age analysis in our work. And so I would take the pink post-it note to say uh, gender, age and gender analysis. So this is a chance for you to have a look at what are in the donor requirements. This is the document, the PDF file, the single form guidelines. We're looking at ECHO in the example. So now we're going to have about 15 minutes to go through this. Let's say until uh, 5th, it'll be in 15 minutes time, in 15 minutes time. So have a look at the description, choose maybe one paragraph and ask yourself, are we doing this in our projects? And then go to the mural board and if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and I will respond. So, uh, Someone's just asked a question in the yeah. chat. Is it the same as comprehensive needs analysis? Good, yes. Yeah. So, good question. My needs assessment, is that a comprehensive needs analysis? Good question. I'd say that there are two different things. So you could have, you could conduct your needs assessment, but then you need to do your analysis of that needs assessment. So from here um, so you need to be able to describe the main problems needs and risks identified by the needs assessment and risk analysis so i'd say there's a slight difference so first thing the donor wants to know is what assessments have you done the dates they took place what methodology did you use um, so this is all the information the donor is expecting so when you're preparing your proposal you need to make sure or how long will the webinar last? Sure, we're due to last for another 40 minutes. So we've got this exercise for about 15 minutes in the mural boards. 
any questions you have about the content, anything that you're looking at as you're going through the single form guidelines, please do type your questions in the chat and we will respond. But we're inviting you to click on the mural board. So if you haven't seen them already, scroll up into the chat and you'll see four boards. And I will be just going through going through them. And, and, and if there's any questions, please, please do. Um, so there are four boards, so do jump in. There's board B, which looks at gender and age marker and resilience markers. Sure, good comment, Nadia. Let's go back. So thank you very much. I'll leave that open. So these are the boards that you have. So we've got on the left hand side in red, those are the sections of the ECHO proposal. Choose the numbers that, that are most interested to you and then go to that mural board. And um, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. But this is a chance now for you to have a think. Think about how the question is how, how you can provide an effective proposal, an effective argument to your donor. And like sitting in an exam, we need to get to know the exam questions. We need to get to know the criteria of assessment. And all of that can be found in the donor guidelines. So jump onto a mural board, add your ideas, copy a post-it note, type in the post-it note, move it across. On each mural board, there are two parts, the left-hand side, the right-hand side. So just take some time. And the two questions are, uh -huh, I've got them here. So these are the two questions that you'll see on your mural board. Question one, how are you already meeting the donor requirements? So what are you already doing? So if you go through the e-single form guidelines, what can you tick off the list and say, yep, we're definitely doing that. We're providing that information. We're answering that question. And then question two, with the rose colored post-it notes, what do you need to be doing to make sure you're meeting the donor requirements? Sure, an example for logic of intervention. So if I was to go to the guidelines, so if you have any questions, please do. Perhaps for some people, we feel like we've been thrown in the deep end, that's, that's okay. For others, perhaps we're very familiar with this format. Um, it all comes with with practice. I know there was many years that I took to to get to familiar with the uh, with this form. So the logic of intervention intervention um, echo considers the most important part um, because this information will they'll be able to assess the quality of the logic. So the logic is if we do something, this will happen. So I talked about an example, if people are struggling to get access to their fields to manage their crops, and the problem is the road conditions. So our logic is, if we improve the road conditions to these fields, people will be able to get access to their crops, and therefore they'll be able to make their harvest, bring home the food. That's the logic. So we're describing what's going to happen thanks to our intervention. And that's obvious, that's often um, put together in a logical framework. And the logical framework will start off with a principal objective, that's the overall goal. And there should only be one of these. So this is a, a chance for you to get to know what ECHO, for example, are expecting in the logic of intervention section of their proposal. So have a look and see if there's anything. So for example, indicators, predefined KOI. Somebody's put that on the mural board, using KOIs. You can get into as many mural boards as you'd like, actually, Nancy, but we thought we'd just suggest to you to go into one to begin with. But if you'd like to jump between, uh, say, logic of intervention and implementation, feel free to switch between the boards just uh, to give you enough time to get into it. <laughs> we suggested one. But at the end of the exercise, we'll keep the mural boards open. And so you can move around and have a look. Somebody mentioned using KOIs. A predefined KOI is a key objective indicator. It's an acronym that ECHO use. It's a, uh, I'll give you an example. 
but often it's uh, Echo will want to see you using their indicators. Here they are. So you can download this as well from the same location. So these are the KOIs, key objective or outcome indicators. And as someone has, has rightly said, a, a top tip for making your logic of intervention effective is to draw from, choose uh, one of the key KOIs, exactly using predefined KOIs. Great. So if you have any other questions, do just type them in the chat. I appreciate for some people, maybe you're not familiar at all with the ECHO framework, the guidelines, and this is all new. That That's totally fine. The structure is what's important. So you might see the sim very similar structure with other donors, say BHA or UNICEF. Great. Beneficiaries, I can see people typing in there, fantastic. Uh, people are saying you need to involve beneficiaries more in project design. Really good point, yes. That can be a real challenge if we've got very limited time or maybe limited access to the people we're looking to support. And we need to know what the donor is, is looking to support in terms of beneficiaries. So do the donors have a certain people group they're looking to support a certain demographic or or perhaps a certain area, a certain number of people. And yes, Said, we will share these materials from today's session with you. I think we will have your email addresses when you signed up. Great. So if you've yeah, do jump into the mural board, see what other people are contributing. Involving beneficiaries in the design is a is a recurring theme. That's really important understanding the underlying risk factors linked to humanitarian crisis. That's really important under the needs assessment part. What you might find with donors is that when you come to do the needs assessment, they have already done their analysis. Um, I will actually just jump onto this now. Uh, where am I? Am I slides? Oops, sorry, <laughs> wrong screen. Um, here we go. So when you get the proposal, the call through from a donor, uh, you might find uh, that the needs assessment's already been done. They'll often describe their understanding of the needs in the call. Here we go. So this is a, an excerpt from a document that will form part of the call to proposal. And it's often, um, it's the, what we, what DEC ECHO, for example, they, they call this their envisaged response. So perhaps the donor, they already have an idea of what the solution is or what they think that people should be doing. And sometimes they'll, they'll put that down in writing and they'll describe to you, well, this is what we think you should do. Uh, uh, here it says, for example, the transcript so echo here, example, saying prioritize the following. So this is really key. So if, do search this out because the donor might already be able to tell you. It's like seeing the answers to the exam. The donor might say, well, actually, this is what we think you need to be doing. Obviously, you would want to check that with your own logic of intervention, with your own needs analysis. But often look through the cool uh, documents and you might find uh, the, doc the donor has already described what they expect you to do. So good comment. Any other questions, put them in the chat. I'm going to give you another five minutes for this exercise. Um, if you finish and you want to have a look at what other people have been posting, please do move around the mural boards. You can access them all and we'll leave them open. Ah, FAM is established and accessible. Can somebody tell me what FAM is? This is under monitoring and evaluation number nine. FAM, what is that? Is there a detailed course for this webinar? There, there is some other forms, yes, of learning. Um, I'll answer that question now. So here at uh, the Academy, we do have an online course as part um, of our... Yes, Nadia, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it's just that uh, the only thing we can see is the PowerPoint that you're sharing. Oh, yes, I'm just... That's correct. Oh, okay, just checking that that's... Yeah, oh, no, okay. thanks yeah. for checking, Nadia. Great. Can you see the Kaya page now? Yes. 
Super. Oh, Agatha, great. FAM has confirmed what, sorry, Agatha has confirmed what FAM stands for. Feedback and accountability mechanisms. Really important. And donors will want to know what are your plans? How are you going to do that? What money have you put aside for that? They'll ask you questions. And that's a really key part of what we do, making sure that we can be accountable to the people looking to serve. Oh, you've been kicked. Nancy's been kicked off the mural board. Apologies. Um, Nadia, can you look at that or do I need to do that? Um, I'm not sure which mural is it. Um, um, strange. Uh, Nancy, if you can try going into a different mural and see if that lets you back in. It might be that the number of people that the mural board could handle at any one time is limited and it, it stops you from, if you've moved from one to another, you you, you get uh, dropped off. Apologies for that. Somebody asked, can we learn more? Yes. So Kaya is an online platform that is hosted uh, here out of the academy and there is a course an introduction to proposal and report writing so what you're experiencing in this webinar uh, you can find more in this course and if you so yeah Nadia do just connect maybe on a private message with Nancy um, that's great thank you uh, something else that you if you want to learn more about ECHO in particular and their proposal writing then you can go to their website they have a learning and training page as well. So they have a series of virtual classrooms. So if you wanted to learn more about what we're doing today, so here we go, how to move around the single form in English. Um, that's in November and you can sign up online. We don't, we're not involved in that. This is all done from Echo, but if you want to dive in specifically to echo some other donors will have their own uh courses online tutorials and often as part of the proposal writing process uh, can we send the link to the virtual classrooms we should be able to yep um uh training here we go i'll put that in the link so oh. but most donors as part of the proposal process, they'll have a call. And they might even have a workshop where they bring people together who want to submit proposal and they will go through the guidelines and they'll go through what they're expecting. So that can be really helpful too. Uh, so do look out um, for what donors have available as you prepare for a call. So for example, here's some other really helpful uh, courses that ECHO have on their website. Um, you can, here we go, discovering, this is some e-learning, so this is all uh, self-paced. So what I've just highlighted is we'll dive into the details of what we've been looking at today. Um, and resilience marker is one of the sections. So there's a lot of information on there. And let me see if I've got the right link for you. Virtual classroom is there. E-learning, you should be able to go from that link and scroll down and find and find that page as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're just going to a couple more minutes for the mural board. So if you have any questions, please do just. Oops, sorry, wrong movement there on my part. Um, oh, so mural board. We're just going to give you a couple more minutes, and then we're going to uh, yeah, just feedback and go through some of those sections ourselves. Great. Uh, if you want to take a five minute comfort break, now's a good time. We've got half an hour to go. If you want to take a five minute comfort break, uh, now's a good time. We'll leave the mural boards open. Um, so if you want a, a five minute comfort break, oh, apologies, um, then now's a good time. We're going to leave the mural board open. If you want a comfort break, so I'm just going to pop the mural board up on the screen for everyone to see, to see how we're getting on. And then we're going to take a five minute comfort break. If you need to stretch your legs, get a glass of water, uh, please do that now. 
oh that's the wrong time my apologies okay just inviting you to take a comfort break if you want to right so comfort break five minutes keep having a look at the mural boards and then after five minutes we're gonna we're gonna come to the last section of the webinar but if you need a break take five minutes if you have any questions post them in the chat otherwise keep having a look at the mural board um, for the issue that you're interested in um, but we're going to take a five minute comfort break thanks so Nadia we'll just take a five minute comfort break and if there are questions we can respond to those and then we'll come back for the last 20 minutes all right see you all in five Yeah, so just having a, a comfort break, <laughs> grab a glass of water if you need to, stretch your legs, and then we're going to finish in the last 20 minutes. So we've got another 23 minutes, but three more minutes for a comfort break. And then, so if you've got any burning questions, pop them in the chat. Any burning questions, pop them in the chat, and we'll address those uh, in the last 20 minutes. If you've got something else you need to go to as well, no worries. We are recording, so you can come back and watch the end if you can't can't make it in person super so yeah just a couple more minutes and then we'll resume um, but uh yeah have a look at the mural board that other people have been working on Ah, resilience marker. Someone's put SWOT analysis. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Strategic plan, short to long term. Super. PESTLE, P E S T L E. No, I'm not familiar with that. So if that's an acronym someone can describe, that'd be great. PESTLE. Intriguing. PDMs, post distribution monitoring. That falls under monitoring innovation. Something that you need to be doing great so if you've identified something you need to be doing to meet these requirements do do make a note uh, people have been mentioning they need to be able to show learning share success stories i know when we worked with bha they were often looking for success stories and we would yeah we would go out and meet with people that we'd been supporting and, and hear from them and get them to tell us their story of, of how we've been part of, of supporting them and yes bha really keen to hear that Yes, understand what meal methodologies donors prefer. Very good. Um, and, and that's it. The great thing is when you're preparing your proposal, don't hesitate to ask the donor. 
if you want to say yeah what what's your preferred meal methodology if you're not sure or if you've got options and do ask the donor and they'll be they'll be very glad to give you recommendations so remember it's a relationship and we're learning from each other so that's great Great. So, great. So we're going to come back together for the last twenty minutes. And so, if you if you'd like to carry on posting in the mural boards, please do. Or if you want to have a look around and see what other people have been been posting, please do. So the idea of of this exercise was to give you a chance to explore, um, explore the echo. Uh, proposal format, their requirements. At the start, we were looking at, okay, well, how do we write winning proposals? Like an exam, we need to get to know the exam questions, we need to get to know the donor, their expectations. So hopefully this, this activity has given you a chance to, to get to know the sort of questions donors are asking. And I think, do go through the guidelines. That's the main, main recommendation. So go through the guidelines, look at what they're asking for. And some of these things they're asking for takes a lot of time. So if they're asking you to do a gender and age analysis, that can take quite a bit of effort and time. So if you know you're going to be supporting, submitting something to ECHO under the next HIP in January, start looking at the guidelines now. If you've got a call for funding coming up in three months with UNICEF, start looking at the guidelines now because some of these requirements do take prep and time and it can be difficult. We were talking about how time was a real challenge. It can be really difficult to do all of this uh, when you've only got a few weeks and the deadline's fast approaching. So do encourage you to study the guidelines as early as you can. Um, now, if we can just raise our hands, are we are we ready to carry on? So use your team, your Zoom function and raise your hand if you're ready to carry on. Super. Super. Great. Raise your hand if you're ready. Super. Fantastic. Glad to hear you're still with us. I know it's a long session. We've got 18 minutes left. And just want to kind of wrap up really on people asking what top tips, uh, what could go wrong? Uh, so, oh, uh, for this one, rather than use the mural, um, I'm going to ask you to respond in the chat. So rather than using the mural, please type in the chat. Thanks for raising your hands to show that you're, you're still um, online. You can lower your hands now for those who, if you've raised your hands, lower your hands. And the question now, rather than using the mural, I'd like you to type in the chat. So please type in the chat, what are the common donor headaches when reviewing proposal submissions? Now, put yourself in the shoes and we will share the content with you at the end. Yep. Put yourselves in the, in the, in the shoes of the donor. You've received your proposals. What headaches might you get when reviewing them? So this time you're going to flip yourselves around rather than you're the team preparing the proposal. You're receiving the proposals. Put yourselves in the shoes of the donor and now type in the chat. So please type in the chat just to save uh, great incomplete information. Thank you, Khalid. Yep. So maybe you're going through a proposal and there's missing information. Perhaps there's a, a dot, dot, dot that didn't get filled in or something that was highlighted that never got filled in. Wordy proposals that don't follow the guidelines. Exactly. Thank you, Nancy. That, that That's a big headache. Yes. And what will happen once you've submitted your proposal, you'll get a list of questions that come back. So unlike an exam, well, an exam, you might get your response with the red marks of what you didn't do, but the donors are a bit more lenient than examiners and they will come back and ask you questions. They'll ask you to be exactly, they'll ask you to be more specific. Perhaps you weren't specific enough. Uh, project activities, not targeting issues that were identified. So yeah, that's right. So you've done your, keep answering this question as you go through, inconsistency across the documents. Exactly. If you're looking at the narrative and the log frame, the budget, they should all look the same. You should be able to walk in and look at the three of them and they should look uh, just the same. Um, so consistency across the three, and those are the three big ones, the narrative. So imagine you've got the narrative sat there, uh, the log frame in the middle, the budget, they should all end up looking the same with the same haircut. <laughs> um, they might be touched up slightly differently, but they should all look, look the same. 
Um, repeated mistakes from the same organization that shows no knowledge of learning that's taken place. So exactly. So if something, especially if you've been working with a donor previously, you need and you've you've had an issue in the past or being able to demonstrate, oh, what have you learned? Um, how can you improve on your learning? Great. Um, what are other headaches? What other headaches? I'm going to put that question back up on the screen. Uh, what other headaches are there? Type in the chat, please. What are the headaches? Imagine yourself the language. Yeah, what do we mean by language, Teshiga? Oh, oh, George, you've got a question for us. Um, I can see your hand is raised. Do type in the chat. If not, uh, asking everyone to lower their hands, but Audrey, your hand is raised. Send uh, Nadia or I a, a private chat message and we can respond to you if there's an issue. Language. So somebody talked about being consistent, specific, um, using our words well. Here's, here's, a, here's a good example. Imagine that you've prepared on the left hand side. That's the text you've received from your team. Your team, you're, you're responsible for finishing up the proposal, you get this long, it's really good, quite excellent, very specific, it's really quality, but then you go to the online platform and you can only put this much in. This is as much as you can put in. So what are you gonna do? How are you gonna get all of that information and put it into a small box like that? Sometimes we can be tempted just to cut that top bit. So, well, okay, let's just cut this top bit and everything else, well, what do we do with that? I know, let's put it in an annex an attaching document so this is i think when we're rushing can be easy to do but the the challenges was no no the annexes are separate documents and that's for additional information if we can we want to be able to summarize all of this and put it into what's available in terms of the character so there will be a limitation in, in how much we can contribute how much text we can type into the proposal document and often that's controlled by the donor they'll say the number of characters that it limits to so there's something just to be aware of. Um, what are the headaches? What are the headaches are there? What are the headaches might the donor have? Um, someone said project activity is not targeting issues identified. So part of the process is to do a problem tree analysis. So understanding the needs and then making sure that all of those issues are addressed those root causes in the middle that, that we are addressing them that's really important um any other headaches any other headaches that you've you've experienced that's right yep yeah, to the donor interest compared to what we want to do um so this is where we need to have our we have our no-go remember at the start we were talking about a no-go decision um are we are we the are they the right donor for this call are we well placed it can be really challenging if we know the needs are there and, and we want to, to provide support and we, we need the funding it can be a real challenge to say no to say no we're not going to go for this funding opportunity is a real a real challenge but sometimes that can be the best thing to do um what other donor headaches might we have what other donor headaches might we have uh i could i saw someone uh mentioned there's a poor participation of affected populations i think that's something that came out of the mural board under needs assessment so this is really key i think um for uh if you look at section five for the echo proposal documents some really good questions here um section 5.2 involvement of beneficiaries in the design of and in the action so here's some really key guidance on how we can in, look to include those that we're looking to support in the design of, of what we're doing um, so the, here it says the partner must explain how and by what means the beneficiaries and the affected populations have been and will be involved in the design implementation and the monitoring of the actions that's a, that's often a key question that gets overlooked um ah, itamad has mentioned sustainability. That's right. So what do we mean by sustainability in humanitarian work? Is that not the place of development projects? Is that within our scope of work? This is a really key question. Um, and one of the, when you go to look at this question under ECHO, for example, they'll talk about disaster preparedness. 
So in everything that we're doing to respond to say immediate needs, well, is there a part of what we do which is preparing people for future disasters? So when we were in Madagascar, for example, we were largely supporting communities to become ready for when a cyclone came, when there'd be a massive flood event. So disaster preparedness is really key. There's also linked to that, if you're familiar with the humanitarian development peace nexus approach. So we don't really have time to dive into this, but if you want to learn more, type that into Google development peace nexus. So this is where we look at the bigger picture of development and peace building and what is the role of humanitarian response within that? Are we there just to respond to needs or are we looking to contribute to to peace, to development? What's our, our role within all of that? So yeah, good, good question. Any other question? We've got 10 minutes left and we're just talking about uh, headaches. You're the donor, you're reviewing a proposal. What are your headaches? What's causing you frustrations? Any other ideas? Um, I'm asking you to type in the chat. I, I appreciate on the on the board it says uh, use the mural board, uh, but please do type in the chat. Um, I've just decided to to move the constitution there. Uh, great, thank you. Um, value for money. Yeah, what do you mean by value for money? And that can be a really tricky one. Yep. So we might have something. Thank you, Tushka, and Ooh, we might have a response that's very um, uh, cost intensive to so resource intensive. Thank you. And I think my I think the key is to be able to to articulate to, be able to describe well to reach these people, for example, with this service. Uh, say it's a health service. We need to. It's an area that's difficult to access. We need to. Uh, hire a mobile clinic, we need to move the mobile clinic into the area, spend a few days. If you can articulate the needs that you have, that that's the key. So a key part of the proposal writing process is in fact knowing, well, this is also for you to design your project. So use the opportunity. You've got everyone is gathered together. Use the opportunity. This is a, a work plan that we worked on in Congo, use the opportunity of a proposal to work through all these questions. How are we going to do the proposed activities? Um, somebody also mentioned um, do no harm principles. That's really key. That links into what we're talking about, development and peace, getting to know uh, what uh, harm your project could could lead to and knowing that you're putting in place mechanisms to, to avoid that. But yeah, spend the time with your teams to yeah, really work through, chew over how are you going to do these activities? What is it going to cost you? Um, it's a really good opportunity because because once you get the contract signed, then you will need to deliver and meet those expectations. Um, Nancy's mentioned plagiarism. Good question. I don't know if any of you are using the chat A, is it chat APT. Nadia, what's that called again? The chat GP something? GPT. GPT. Is anybody using chat? chat GPT for preparing their proposals. Perhaps this is something that we need to think about. I think often we'll refer to what we've submitted previously. So I know in, in our work, sometimes we will take an existing proposal and we'll rework it perhaps for a different donor, but it's the same same project. So we need to be careful not just to copy and paste and make sure it's relevant and up to date. Um, Yes, and if we're working with other co-applicants, thank you, Louise, if we're working with other organizations, how do we work together, making sure it's clear who's leading what type of work, the role of consortium. So that's something that also is becoming uh, more common is that organizations are looking, uh, donors are looking for uh, consortiums. Is anybody aware of the grand bargain? It's it's just, this has just come to an end. But is anybody aware of the grand bargain? If you can raise your hand using Zoom, anyone aware of the grand bargain? We've got five more minutes, but anybody aware of the grand bargain? Yes, there's one hand there. Great. So raise your hand in Zoom if you're aware of the grand bargain. Mm. Quite a few of us. So this is now from June 2023. It's just been concluded and there's a new iteration. But 
Speaking into consortium, these are engagements that the humanitarian funding system wanted to install in proposals. So if you want to have another, just kind of maybe closing remarks on how to be effective in proposal writing, this is what the grand bargains were looking to make humanitarian proposals about. So uh, for example, uh, needs assessment, improve joint and impartial needs assessment. So working with other organizations to do needs assessments, um, uh, looking to enhance engagement between humanitarian and development actors. So Google as well, Grand Bargain, that'll give some really good uh, tips on what's going to give you a winning proposal. Um, but just to finish, if you've got any other questions, feel free to add them in. But I'm just going to close now uh, in these next couple of minutes. But I'll stay online afterwards if you if you do have any burning questions that weren't answered. Um, but yeah, like we've been talking about, it's um, make sure everything's thoroughly checked. So sometimes you it can be good to have someone who's from the outside. Um, of your immediate team working on the proposal who can step back and say, right, let's just check, let's go through, have a checklist of some sort where you can go through the donor requirements and you can answer these questions. So if there's a question in the donor guidelines, somebody needs to be able to go through your proposal and say, yep, we've done that. Yes, it's included. Yes, oh, it's not included, but we can explain why. And it's this is a this is quite a laborious process you can imagine. Working together as a team is obviously a key part to it everyone will have um, a different uh, perspective um, but sometimes it can be helpful to have someone who sees the overall picture so you might work on this section of the proposal uh, with some of your team members um, your, your, another team might work on this but you, you do need someone who's got that vision of everything and to make sure it's coherent as a document, somebody already mentioned that those key documents, narrative budget, log frame, they need to be coherent, they need to match. Something else that t t someone's already mentioned as well, which is really key, is ensure that you highlight what makes your organization well placed to respond to the humanitarian needs. So perhaps it's your experience working with the affected population, perhaps it's the skill sets of the members of your team, but your organization will have a a certain uniqueness to it or you, you're, you're you're really good at something or you're really well placed or you really know the people you're working with and support so make sure you highlight that do highlight yes some of the questions here as you go through the proposal document are quite generic but do but do highlight what makes you as an organization unique and as you're preparing the proposal remember that there'll be lots of rewriting some sections you might throw away or you might pull back out of the, of the bin so do think about before you start think about as i'm sure you're aware if you're working on proposals already how are you going to manage the different versions different iterations of your documents so document control is really important set up a way of working that allows everybody access to all the documents but gives you a clear process of when a document's complete or when it's time for review who's going to review it and it can very easily you can lose track of which is the most up-to-date version and that can make it even harder so we know time is going to be uh, an issue so do take the time to clarify how you're going to prepare the documents and edit them and work on them as you go through um so we're, we're pretty much at the end the other thing just to highlight i'm sure you're aware is that donors are standards humanitarian standards are really key so do make sure that you refer to the sphere handbook the core humanitarian standard uh, these are also helpful in guiding you through how to respond to the questions that are found in the proposal uh, document so these different sections for example and uh, uh, <laughs> we're coming to the end now um, for example field coordination section 11 uh, we know that okay section criteria six of the core humanitarian standard go to that part of the core humanitarian standard and that'll give you really top tips of how to address uh, that part of coordination we've reached the end of our webinar thank you so much for joining us today are there any questions you have for us we do have a 
evaluation form. Nadia, if you want to, oh, Nadia, can you share your screen actually, please, with the learning outcomes and share the evaluation form in the chat, please? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm just sending the I'm just sending it the link right now. Super, um, thank you. Great. Thank you. Nadia. So you should see a link in the chat. It's to a form. Uh, we'd like to get your feedback on this session. So you should be able to click on the form and this should pop up. So we're not asking for your name or your email. So this is anonymous. Please do respond. We're keen to get your feedback. Is this what you were after? Is this what you're expecting? Uh, and then, yeah, what else would you like to learn and any, any other feedback you have for us? And then, Nadi, if you can share your screen and we'll just have a, a look at the learning objectives to see whether we did cover everything. If we haven't, we can we can come back to something. Well, thank you, Nadia. Super. Great. So this is what we were hoping to go through today. Um, tips in proposal writing. So I shared some of my tips with you. Um, we didn't really dive into creating logical frameworks. I think that is something that you need to, we need to organize a, another session for. Um, if you go into the Kaya proposal writing session, there should be a piece on logical frameworks there. Winning proposals, we hope it's helped give you a better sense of what it makes to uh, write an effective proposal, what the main success points are for approval, uh, how to link needs assessments with your proposals, um, yeah, how to not write proposals. So the headaches we talked about, I hope that's helpful. Concept notes we touched on briefly, finding potential donors. Yeah, so how do we reach out? And I think, yeah, I think we talked a little bit about uh, how we can uh, reach out to donors. Um, key words to put in proposal writing. So I think, yeah, going through, look at the grand bargain. I know it's now uh, completed that, that those that list. Look at the grand bargain and look at the core humanitarian standard. Uh, those, yeah, do refer to those standards. Those those are, that will demonstrate to donors that you're yeah keeping up to date with, with the events. If you have any questions, uh, please do, type in the chat. I'm going to stay online for another five, 10 minutes. So if you want to stay on, um, Nadia, we'll, we can close the meeting. You can stop the recording. Thank you so much. Uh, the time is now up for the time we put aside, but I, I've got a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions, hang around and put them in. Thank you so much. Uh, the time is now up for the time we put aside, but I, I've got a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions, hang around and put them in.